Hey guys, welcome to Hip Use History, where you're not about to hear a history lecture. No sir, re Bob. What we have been doing with some of these newer episodes is throwing up big political, historical, governmental questions, kind of batting it around a little bit, and then engaging in the American sport debate down in the comments below. And while you could say anything, folks, you know, we're really trying to push the conversation forward. So extreme partisanship shall be frowned upon but certainly it's a free society. So no popping down and popping up, no inserting crazy nostalgic TV theme music. All right, that's the only time I'll do it. So why is Congress broke, right? They have a 10% approval rating that's right below cockroaches, right above the swine flu. So obviously they're not doing very well, are they? So one of the reasons, and it's less than a reason than really kind of a concept about the whole question, is that it's supposed to be kind of broken. That if you go back to the Federalist Papers and you look at the roots of the Constitution, there are many that would argue that um, we're supposed to have a limited government. It's supposed to be hard to pass legislation. That government's only role is to protect our liberty. And if they're trying to fix problems, they're probably not supposed to be doing that. We should be doing that. So having a House and a Senate, having kind of these internal rules, you have to pass the same legislation through the House and the Senate, um, it's supposed to be difficult. The founding fathers and mothers wanted it that way. And certainly other layers on top of that, like unwritten constitution, like the filibuster, requiring 60 votes for most things in the Senate, and up to maybe this week, Supreme Court justices, maybe not next week, but legislatively, you need 60 votes. And now while that's supposed to further compromise, many people like it because it stops Congress and the Senate specifically from doing big things. So number one, supposed to be that way. All right, my second reason is a guy named Jerry. And of course, I'm talking about gerrymandering. And gerrymandering is basically how a state legislature has the ability to draw their district lines for their state. And those district lines end up being house seats. So the more people you have, the more house seats you have. So you can't gerrymander in Alaska because they only have one district. But when you have a state with a lot of districts, and if that state legislature is controlled by one party, then they can take out their little magic pen and their map and start drawing those lines to um, affect the population in a way that's going to be politically beneficial to themselves. So if they see a highly dense population of the other side's voters, you know, those people, so they can take their pen and they can kind of mark up that district in a way that takes that group of people and like flowers in the wind just kind of have them spread into the other districts. And the net outcome is more seats for your political party. So how does this have anything to do with Congress? Well, if you have swing districts, the way maybe it's supposed to be, maybe it's not, but in the past, we had a lot of swing districts. Um, the incentive was to compromise. If you wanted to get reelected, you had to get stuff done to come back to your district and run that race and win moderates and maybe some of your side, but you had to get people in the middle too. Not in a gerrymandered district. In fact, it's the opposite. So if you take a Republican gerrymandering idea like the Freedom Caucus, which used to be called the Tea Party, these representatives are coming from districts that are deeply red. They've been gerrymandered in a way where they just can't lose their seats. In fact, if they compromise, if they they don't go with the ideology of the purest of the pure, that they're going to get primaried and they're going to lose their job. So having those districts gerrymandered has an effect in Congress because it's going to stop compromise. It's going to stop people from reaching across the aisle. Number three, the defragmentation of media. So what this means is um, with the explosion of media and the internet and channels and the deregulation of media and the ability for media to really kind of focus on demographics, that means that everybody in a sense gets to listen to the news that they like. So it's not like Walter Cronkite in the old days, we all heard it wasn't going good in Vietnam and we all kind of agreed it wasn't going good in Vietnam and we could debate whether we should fight more to make it go better or withdraw to make it go better. But we we agreed on a certain set of facts. Not so true anymore, right? If I watch Fox, I get my Fox News. And if I watch, you know, MSNBC, I get my MSNBC News. At least that's the thought process. Maybe one of them is right. Maybe one of them is wrong. But the idea is, is that when I get fed what I believe, and it's that echo chamber, I don't listen to anybody else's idea because their news is fake. Their news isn't real. And certainly this isn't going to allow for, you know, dialogue and for compromise. 
compromise that makes you elect people that agree with you. And if they um, go against that, then you know you don't have faith in them. They've sold out. So not having a set of facts, having a hyper pluralistic or a defragmentized kind of media, it might be good. You know, in the idea that it's a democracy, there's lots of different voices, lots of different opinions. But if people aren't um, spreading their you know attention across different types of news sources, um, and they're only believing the kind that they're getting, that's not going to be good for representation. It's going to mirror that in Congress, and then Congress isn't going to be able to get anything done. So number four, I got Big Momo. You got Big Momo? Yeah, I got to put money up on the top of the list somewhere, right? Um, certainly after Citizens United, whether you're for that or against it, there's been a flood of new money and money into political campaigns. It's always been bad, but it's real bad now. And there's a couple of different reasons why that's bad in terms of gridlock. Um, number one is in the olden days when you weren't always fundraising, you'd be kicking it back OG style with your peeps in the house, uh, you know, you would reach across the aisle, you'd go to parties or there would be common events or have dinner or have social events. And at the root of everything, I believe, is human relationships. So when you don't have relationships with the other side, there's no chance for real compromise. And I think that money at the end of the day is what has made people take their eye off that factor because they're always having to raise money. You always have to go to a fundraiser. I don't got time for my peeps in the house. I think that that's a problem. And certainly the money itself that you're, in a sense, beholden um, to get more money from those self-interest or special interests. And I don't believe that special interests necessarily always get what they want, but I do believe they can kill what they don't want. And that's at the heart of gridlock, is that anytime you try to do something, there's a moneyed interest that's going to throw a monkey wrench in it to make sure that it doesn't happen. And there's a lot of politicians that are, in a sense, indebted to you know technology firms or communication firms or oil companies or whatever it might be, because they have to. They have to raise millions and millions of dollars. And remember, in the House, you have to run every two years. So that means as soon as you get elected, you're like, yay, where's the phone so I can have a fundraising party for my next election? All right, for number five, we're going to blame the big man or woman, but not yet a woman. And that would be the president, a lack of leadership. Um, When you look at, you know, big legislative victories and you look at either um, having some type of, you know, awful event occur, like the Great Recession. And then we get kind of, you know, Dodd-Frank and we get legislation out of that because everybody is reacting off of that. Or 9-11, the Patriot Act, right? That certainly didn't hit any gridlock, did it? So natural events or disasters certainly can have an effect. But when you think of all of the other ones, like Medicaid and Medicare, that's LBJ, man. That's LBJ. He was the, uh, you know, uh, majority Senate leader. He knew how to talk to his peeps in Congress, and he was able to get things, you know, greased to get through. Sometimes it's ugly, but having the leadership on top, a Ronald Reagan figure, you might not be the biggest fan of Ronald Reagan, but he was able to work with Tip O'Neill, who was the Speaker of the House. He was a Democrat. He faced Democrat majorities. He got legislation passed. Bill Clinton, you don't have to like the guy, but he was able to work with Newt Gingrich to get major reforms in the 1990s. But since that, it's been kind of a hard road. It's been very partisan, kind of a lack of leadership, at least with the other side, when it comes to, you know, George H.W. Bush or George W. Bush or uh, Barack Obama or now President Trump. We see them working with their own party, but we really don't see them reaching across the aisle. So I probably missed other reasons. You leave it down below. I'm certain a lot of people are like, it's the Democrats, Republicans' fault. So you can have that argument if you want down below. But at the end of the day, I think we all want an America that works better for everybody. What kind of nonsense was that, Mr. Hughes? All right, giddy up for the learning and all that good stuff, guys. Make sure that if you haven't subscribed, you do that. And I can flash thumbnails up there because it's my video channel and I can do whatever I want. And you probably should subscribe and go check out some of those videos anytime you want to grow your brain. All right, I'm going to say it because I say it at the end of every lecture because I mean it with all my heart. Where attention goes, energy flows. And we'll see you guys next time. Does you press my buttons?